Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 7th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, coming off the Prop 1 debate, some are now suggesting that to reduce the pressure for increased taxes from industry and continue to attract outside investment, the state should completely eliminate the PFD and divert the money to state government. Second, what we will be looking for this coming week as the state issues first the fall revenue forecast and then behind it the governor's proposed FY22 budget. Third, we look at whether the feds are likely to enact additional COVID fiscal relief before the end of the year. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into it. Uh, the, the, it's already it started. The push to eliminate the PFD. They're coming. They're gunning for it. They've already taken part of it, but they're gunning for the rest, it looks like. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Michael, there was a there's an op ed in uh, uh, the weekend's uh, Anchorage Daily News authored by Roger Marks. Uh, for those who want to find it, the headline is the age of Alaska exceptionalism uh, is over. Some may remember Roger uh, as a, as a, uh, an advocate of no on one during the recent election cycle, no on uh, on on oil taxes. He appeared in debates on behalf of of no on one and staunchly defended that we shouldn't be uh, increasing taxes on the industry uh, that uh, that uh, the industry uh, couldn't couldn't take anymore. Um, and in this op ed uh, for the first time, uh, maybe I just haven't noticed others, uh, but for the first time, there's an explicit call. Uh, he makes an explicit call. Uh, and it's the first time that I've really seen anybody out of for, on this argument make an explicit call basically to end the PFD. Um, the, the thesis is uh, this, with the state, and, and I'm quoting, with the state not knowing how it will finance itself, outsiders become an attractive target for excess, excessive taxation. There's the famous Senator Russell Long quote that I use as well, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the guy behind the tree. The problem is you cannot tax the guy if he's not here. Any outside business which understands the state's fiscal situation would be very reluctant to come here. Uh, that's the close quotes. Uh, but he says they're very reluctant to come here because of the potential for uh, additional taxation. He doesn't reference uh, uh, Proposition 1, but but that's sort of the underlying theme that's, that's laying back in there. And then from that premise that that the state has to you know, fix itself in order to continue to attract outside investment, the rest of the the rest of the piece basically goes on to say that we should eliminate the PFD um, as part of as part of the overall fiscal plan uh, because after all uh, it's just uh, it's just a giveaway program those revenues should be melded into state revenues before we start taxing anybody uh, Alaskans or uh, more particularly outside interests and and also argues that as long as the PFD is out there. You're going to have people who would who would increase taxes in order to uh, protect the PFD uh, or to, to to pay the PFD, and, and outside interests won't invest uh, in uh, uh, in Alaska as long as they see the potential 
that uh, that voters uh, could protect could could increase their own self interest by increasing the PFD through taxation of outside interests. So basically, what what he's what he's arguing is if you want to get investment in the state, uh, you're going to have to eliminate the PFD. That uh, as he as as the title says, the age of Alaska exceptionalism is is over. I um, I sort of thought this would show up. This argument would show up at some time. Uh, show up during uh, during the debate. I didn't think it would show up uh, this early. It's basically, it, yeah, it sort of leaves me with the impression of, well, we crushed you on Prop One, uh, and so now we're just going to go ahead with the next step of our of our grand plan, uh, and uh, and and meld the PFD into government revenues, so we don't have to we don't have to be concerned. We outside interests, we investors, don't have to be concerned about uh, about uh, that level of taxation that, that at least you're using those revenues uh, to fund government before you come uh, before you come calling on us, and I think it's an I, I think it's an argument that we're going to see uh, replay uh, in in some parts of the legislature. I can see Steve Thompson uh, raising this argument. I can see Bart LeBon raising the argument, uh, and I can see uh, other uh, so-called business Republicans. Uh, business-oriented Republicans um, uh, pursuing this argument, yeah. and I think it's one. I think it's one we're going to have to meet. Well, and it's not like they're making any bones about it. It's not like they're making any secret about it. This is my favorite quote out of the whole article. Uh, there's an issue. Uh, there is the issue of short-term versus long-term in comparing well-being as higher dividends make for decreased services. Now, the dividends. And the, 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 the revenues from the dividends have never been conflated until this last few four or five years with any kind of government services because it was, again, it was our portion, the people's portion of that money. The government got 97% of all the other monies. Now they want that 3%, but now they're going to claim decreased services is, of course, they can't get their hands on it. So they're not even making a secret about it. And, of course, there's no discussion on the effect of lowering uh, lower income Alaskans or the disproportionate effect on the various strata of, uh, of financial hierarchy here in the state. And it's, uh, you know, this, you're right. This is exactly where they're coming out that you could see that this is the tack they're going to take this entire session. Yeah. It's, um, I, I mean, the, there is some, there is some, uh, piece of it that's addressed to the, to the income distribution argument. Roger makes a statement that, um, uh, the, um, uh, it, taxes versus the dividend are a zero sum game that if you if you if you tax rather than uh cut the dividend in order to uh, to develop uh, government revenues that uh, that is a zero sum game and and it's but it's not i mean I, that that's the that's that's the that's the argument that 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 i and others are going to have all the way through the 2016 icer study makes clear that of the alternatives, cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and has the largest adverse impact uh, on on the overall Alaska economy. It's not a zero sum game. There are better ways. If if you have to raise revenues, there are better ways to raise revenues for for not only Alaska families but the overall economy uh, than than cutting the PFD. A uh, uh, flat tax that 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 put has all Alaskans. Uh, bearing some of the costs, bearing an equal percentage of the costs, uh, and and includes non-residents is is certainly, in in my mind, the leading alternative. Uh, but there are a lot of different alternatives to, that are better for raising revenues uh, than cutting the PFD. But basically, what Roger is arguing is is outside interests, outside investors don't want to pay any taxes. Basically, I mean, and and so cutting the PFD first. Uh, in order to uh, uh, use those revenues first to fund government, uh, and then maybe having taxes piled on top of that, some small taxes piled on top of that, um, uh, is the better course. But it just it completely ignores the distributional impact. It completely that the PFD cuts, uh, using PFD cuts as revenues, uh, takes most, uh, almost all the money out of middle and lower income Alaska families because of its impact on their well-being, has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, allows non-resident workers, uh, non-residents earning income in the state to completely escape tax. They, they're, they're entirely excused from uh, contributing at all to, uh, uh, to, to the revenue burden. 
uh, and and just completely it it just uh, the how you're raising these revenues. Roger tries to he he wants to focus on the argument that uh, that it's uh, uh, it's all about outside investors and making Alaska. Uh, uh, attractive to outside investors, and and so you don't want any taxes if you possibly can. You want to you want to uh, uh, impose these, this burden on on Alaskans, uh, Alaska families first by by cutting the PFD. It's um, I mean, we, we, we those who support the PFD need to face up to the fact that they're now coming for the full PFD, um, piling on from from the no on one. Uh, they're now coming for the full PFD by saying, not only do we not want increased taxes, we want you, we, we in the industry want you to tax yourself first. We want you to tax Alaska families first by cutting the PFD before uh, you start looking, uh, you start looking to us again. And that's, that's that's the that's the next step, and as I say, we're going to see this argument show up in the legislature. Uh, Harold's got a good comment in the chat room. He said, "So he said no on oil paying uh, their fair share or more taxes, and yet he wants to end that. Now he wants to end the PFD, which pretty much sums it up in a nutshell. So no for anybody else to pay, but yes for all Alaskans to pay for this, especially the lowest income Alaskans, and sacrificing the overall Alaska economy on the altar of." Uh, of this spend. And of course, nowhere is the discussion of do we need some of these services? Are we being efficient? There's no discussion on the costs or the uh, or the uh, the spending itself. It's all about the revenues, which of course you and I have talked about for years. That's the stance that they take. That there's never a discussion on revenues. It's always, uh, or excuse me, never a discussion on spending. It's always a discussion on revenues. How we can get more or boost it or facilitate more revenues. And this is going to be the, the 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 direction that they take on it. Well, industry. I mean, Michael, it's 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 fair. If if you understand this issue, it's fairly clear what's coming through here. Industry in the top twenty percent don't want to challenge. They don't want to use their political capital on challenging spending. They just want somebody else to pay the costs uh, of 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 government. They 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 see a downside to to them challenging uh, spending levels because then. Uh, people will start looking to them to to contribute to it. So what they would what they want to do instead is just sort of accept spending levels as they are, uh, and 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 shove the costs off on somebody else. We're never going to get to a to a good debate. We're never going to get industry invested. We're never going to get the top twenty percent invested uh, in debating uh, spending levels as long as they don't have to pay for it. Right. And 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 they don't have to pay for it as long as as we're using PFD cuts uh, to fund it, so it's a, we, I mean, people who say, well, you know, we, we need it, we need to talk about spending. Yes, we do, but the only way you're going to get the top 20% and and industry engaged in talking about spending levels uh, is if they have some skin in the game. Right. And as long as long as you can push it out, as long as they they are successful in pushing it out to PFD cuts, pushing it off on lower and middle in, or middle and lower income Alaska families, they're not going to talk about spending levels. Right. When can we put Alaskans first, not outside interests? Well, I mean, this I think that's a function of us having to get uh, the proper, uh, you know, the, the right legislators in there. That's the problem is that, uh, you know, we are already, uh, you know, the, the problem is, is our elected officials are the ones that are making these decisions. Uh, and they think we know they know better than we how to spend our money. And, of course, they think they're putting Alaskans first. I mean, that's how I read it anyway, Brad. I mean, these guys think that they somehow know better than the average Alaskan how to spend their money. Am I am I wrong on that? Well, you're not you're not wrong on that. But but here here's here's what 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 sort of not getting enough attention. They are putting some Alaskans first. They're putting they're putting the top 20 percent first. Uh, by uh, by using PFD cuts as the means of, of financing government, the top twenty percent are indifferent. Um, uh, I mean, some some people say, well, why doesn't Natasha push more for cuts? Why doesn't the why don't they use their political capital to to insist on cuts? They don't care as long as you're using um, uh, PFD cuts to uh, to finance government because it has so little so little impact on them. Uh, they will care where, where you're going to see finally, you know, spending resistance or or spending cuts 
is 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 if we keep going down this road once they use up the entire pfd then you know there's the potential that they're going to be taxed and all of a sudden they'll get interested uh in in capping spending but as long as they can use pfd cuts uh, uh to finance spending it's not really impacting them they're pushing the costs off on middle and lower income alaska families so you look at the legislature they are looking out for some alaskans they're looking out for the top 20 percent and they're looking out for um, uh, industry by by pushing those costs off on middle and lower uh, income Alaska families. They're not looking out for all Alaskans, but they're looking out for their campaign donors and and in those districts that are wealthier than others, uh, the constituents in those districts, uh, uh, the the constituents in those wealthy districts. Uh, they're, <laughs> the only way you're going to get them to look out for all Alaskans is if all Alaskans have skin in the game, if all Alaskans face the, 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 the prospect of having to pay for government costs uh, if spending doesn't come down. But until we do that, until we, until we focus the revenue burden on all Alaskans, uh, uh, equitably across on all Alaskans, until we do that, uh, you're, not gonna get, you're not gonna get some segments of the legislature uh, pushing back on costs. Well, and that's where you negate uh, Roger Marx's argument about a zero-sum game. If all Alaskans had skin in the game, it wouldn't be a zero-sum game because they would look to reducing the size and scope of government so that they had to pay the lowest amount possible. I mean, that's just the bottom line there. Uh, yeah, exactly. All, all, of a sudden, all of a sudden, the top 20% would, would use their considerable political capital to push back on spending. But this way, they don't. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm, I'm finding myself agreeing with Harold this morning all over the place, which is scary. Alaskans are already the most heavily taxed people on the planet. And we've talked about that in the past that, you know, we don't see the taxes. They're stealth taxes. They're hidden taxes because all that money flows directly into the state treasury instead of through our hands. And, uh, and I would agree with that. I mean, not only the taking and taxing of the PFD, but all those royalty and revenue payments. I mean, if that all flowed through Alaskans' hands and we, you know, all received a check for $15,000 every year and then got issued a tax bill for thirteen or 14000 we'd all poop our drollies and the, and the spending in this state would come to a screeching halt. So uh, I think that that is 100% true. Yeah, I would I would amend one thing on on Harold's statement, and that is some Alaskans are the most heavily taxed. Again, the burdens being pushed to middle and lower income Alaska families. They're the ones that are that are that are paying the tax burden. The top twenty percent. I mean, it's horribly inverse. The top twenty percent, though the the wealthiest uh, segment of of Alaska are paying the least. Uh, in terms of in terms of the tax burden, because they've through PFD cuts they've shoved it to middle and lower income Alaska families. So it's not it's not like all Alaskans are heavily taxed. It's it's a subsegment, middle and lower income Alaska families. Yeah, um, we all have skin in the game, says Willie. The PFD it just takes the elimination of them to get to realize it. But Willie, I think you don't understand is proportionally the PFD affects the middle and lowest income people, uh, you know, most. And the wealthy are more than happy to give up that fifteen, sixteen hundred bucks because it means that if they had to pay their share of it on a, like for example, on a flat tax basis, it would be thousands and thousands of dollars that they would have to pay for state services. I think that's the main difference there. Chris says, sometimes I wonder if Brad is live or not. Michael could be pulling off an interview with previous Brad call-ins. I mean, it seems like we're repeating ourselves, Brad, but we've been repeating ourselves for the last five, six years. Uh, but I mean, I think finally people, well, on this program are listening, but, and I think we're finally starting to get some traction in the legislature, obviously with some of the changeover of the players, but I mean, this is what we've needed to do for the last six years is to get people listening and hearing what we've been saying, which is there's an inequity in what's going on and who's paying for government. And we need to make it, uh, we need to make it more equitable across the board. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're you're right, Michael. I mean, we we do repeat we do repeat these same themes, but but <laughs> it, it's 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 the it's the right theme to repeat. I mean, it's it's the right theme that we need that we need that we need to be talking about. We're just coming under continual attacks. The PFD is coming under these uh, continual attacks 
from from different fronts. Now it's the the no on one crowd having having you know steamrolled and and having convinced everybody we that industry was was in peril and so we needed to defeat uh, defeat uh, the all tax. Now they're rolling into uh, no now they're rolling into the PFD and um, and we need to I mean. It, there, there are reasons that that shouldn't occur, and they're the same reasons we've talked about. We've talked about all along. Absolutely. Let's move on to number two, which is a discussion on the spring. Uh, excuse me, the fall revenue forecast and a proposed budget when it is published next week. Give us a tease on this, Brad, before we go to break. Well, we're we're going to see uh, the the uh, fall revenue forecast come out uh, sometime this week. Last year, it was out. Uh, on December 6th, uh, it's December 8th today. So at some point it's going to come out next year or next year, next week, the budget comes out uh, next Tuesday on the, uh, on the 15th by the 15th, uh, the budget comes out. I've got some, I've got some thoughts on what people should be looking for uh, when these different publications uh, come out in the coming week, what you should focus on. So we'll talk about that in the second segment. Moving on with Brad Keithley here, second segment. We're into number two of our weekly top three. We're talking about the uh, fall revenue forecast, the potential for the new budget. Brad, you've got some ideas on this, and you've uh, shared some uh, shared some graphs and everything. What are what are we looking at here? So there's two documents that are that are coming out in the in this week and next. The first is the is the annual fall revenue forecast. Uh, from the Department of Revenue, that revenue forecast is a is a detailed document. It's a long document. It is an analysis of the source of revenue uh, for state government, uh, a discussion of where they come from, a discussion of of uh, of, of the impact of of various of them. Um, most importantly, it is the the revenue forecast that the legislature then relies on in the coming fiscal year uh, to develop the the coming years uh years budget there's two pieces of that uh of that revenue forecast that that i just jump on the 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 second i get my hands on it one is the revenue forecast for the coming fiscal year uh and because that's the one the legislature is going to do uh use but at but equally uh the 10-year forecast uh that uh that uh uh, the Department of Revenue does. It's not, as we've talked previously on the show, it's not enough just to focus on the next fiscal year. Uh, we, we're now, since we've used up savings, we're now living sort of hand to mouth. Um, and so we need to be looking at uh, where we're headed 10 years from now, uh, as well as, over the next 10 years, as well as as well as in the next year, because there's things, there's things we should be doing now to prepare ourselves uh, for the next 10 years um, uh, that, uh, that we that if we don't do them now, if we put them off, we're we're going to be even more hand to mouth. We're going to be in even more dire straits um, in in coming years. So from from the revenue forecast standpoint, Department of Revenue forecast, um, there should be something about it in the press when it's published. It'll be available on the Department of Revenue's tax division uh, website. Well, it's both available both on the Department of Revenue, the main page for the Department of Revenue, as well as on the tax division. Uh, 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 page, uh, and and that will be that's an important document. Following that, by December fifteenth, by a week from today, uh, if, if not on a week from today, the governor will uh, come out with his uh, with his uh, uh, budget, uh, FY twenty two proposed budget. Uh, that's the document then that that will that will propose how the legislature deals with. Uh, the uh, the budget during the uh, during the coming year, and that document uh, uh, by statute uh, is it contains two things. One, it contains uh, both a, a detailed analysis of the of the budget, the proposed budget for the next fiscal year, but it also contains by statute uh, is supposed to contain by statute uh, a ten year plan, uh, which is which is taking the Department of Revenue's forecast. Of, uh, of of revenues over the next decade, uh, sort of, sort of looking into how the government's going to deal with those revenues, and how it's going to deal with uh, with any shortfalls. Again, because we're out of savings, uh, that document's going to be hugely important. Uh, I I'm I'm usually I, I usually both I usually look at the ten year plan first to be honest, because the ten year plan 
both contains the proposed next year as well as the future years. And by looking at the 10-year plan, you, you can sort of wash through quickly uh, whatever um, – whatever gimmicks they're trying to they're, the government's trying to use to get through the just get through the next year you know drawing down a, a, a spending a savings pot over there or a savings pot over there that that will not that's not sustainable in terms of getting you through the next 10 years but might get you through uh, through one fiscal year so the the 10 year plan to me is usually the most important document i start there and then i back up to the detailed analysis of uh, of of what's coming now uh, two years ago, uh, in uh, uh, in Governor Dunleavy's first budget, they didn't publish the 10-year plan uh, with the budget, um, and it wasn't until March, I think, then we fi- that we finally got the 10-year plan. Right. And I and I and I think that's a mistake for the administration to do that uh, because they're not uh, uh, letting Alaskans see the see the whole picture. But uh, though that that the 10-year plan uh, will be part is is by statute part of the budget. Uh, and uh, and something that uh, that I think is important for Alaskans to go read uh, quickly as well. And what are some of the highlights out of the ten year plan that you know this chart that you sent me? What 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 are some of the highlights that people really need to be looking at? Should we be looking at the overall uh, you know the increase in government? Should we be looking at the continued deficit? I mean, you've got deficits projected out for the next ten years, essentially two billion dollars plus for the next ten years. Um, yeah. So, so the ten-year plan will have two things. It'll have two important things. It'll have spending levels, uh, and the way they've been doing it the last couple of years, last few years, they've been doing various scenarios. Um, and some of those scenarios are: what if we just held spending constant? What if we reduce spending by a certain amount? What if spending just grew with inflation? Um, uh, so you'll see you'll see various potentially various alternatives to spending levels. But the first thing to focus on. Uh, is spending levels, and then you'll see revenue levels. Now, revenues break into two parts. They break into the traditional uh, revenue levels, which are or traditional revenues, which are largely oil taxes plus some other uh, historic taxes that uh, that we have. And then uh, the other source of revenue now is the is the PFD, or excuse me, the the permanent fund earnings left over after uh, the PFD. Uh, and and you'll see revenues come from those two sources and you'll see revenue levels and the difference between the two, the difference between spending and that combined revenue level uh, uh, is the deficit. So you're lo- I guess you're looking for three things. You're looking for how are they dealing with spending? You know, what, what's, what's the proposal with respect to spending levels? Are they growing it? Are they reducing it? Are they holding it constant? Uh, and then on the revenue side, uh, what are the revenue levels? And then I guess there's a question about are they are they assuming PFD cuts of a certain amount uh, in those revenue levels? Are they diverting more of the permanent fund earnings uh, to government uh, in 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 those analysis? But it's spending revenues deficit is is what you're going to see from the budget. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Uh, final takeaway on number two before we move on to number three. Pay attention. The ten-year plan's important. Am I hitting all the, the 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 highlights there? You are, and and people ought to look at it. And that the ten-year plan is going to see where the deficit levels are. You're not going to see that out of the revenue forecast because that's just focused on the revenue side. The ten-year plan and the budget is is going to give you the the match of revenues against spending, and those are going to show the deficit levels. Uh, and the chart I've done is based upon the spring revenue forecast uh, uh, updated by some presentations that that uh, revenue and uh, and ledge finance did uh, in October um, uh, but it's but you know we're gonna see something uh, around this and 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 people ought to be people who are interested in this issue ought to be ought to be digging in and understanding those numbers uh, Charlie asks I wonder if the 10-year plan will reflect the impact of the Biden administration on oil revenue in the out years. And that's the big question because we have no idea what's going to be happening here. With a, I mean, we kind of know what direction the Biden administration is going to take, and we know it's going to have some kind of detrimental effect, but we don't know yet as to what the impact is going to be. But I doubt that it's going to be a positive impact. You? Yeah, I, I doubt it's going to be a positive impact. Um, so they do oil prices. They're, the oil revenues come from two different sources. They come from the production forecast and from the oil price forecast. On the oil price forecast, they use the futures market basically uh, anymore the last couple of years. 
And, and so the futures market will reflect uh, at least the, the markets, the oil market's current expectation of what, uh, of what the Biden administration means. And the futures market is, is remarkably flat. I'm not sure I've ever seen it this flat across, uh, <coughs> excuse me, across time. The last future, the last I did uh, showed $48, not only tomorrow, but $48 10 years from now. Uh, just remarkably flat. So futures market is starting to take into account some of the Biden administration. On the production side, uh, the the difference will be in PICA, will be in how uh, the in, in the ten year window will be in how uh, uh, how the uh, revenue forecast takes into account PICA. If it includes some PICA volumes, I think those are going to be at risk from uh, from the Biden administration. So it, it, it'll probably show up on the production side. They'll probably talk about it uh, in the revenue forecast. If I were them, I would talk about it. But uh, uh, there may be some risk on the production side. Your expectation of the governor's budget ideas and all, all that? Hit me with it. Well, I, th- I think we're going to I think we're going to see huge deficits, uh, uh, 10 year deficits. Uh, I think the gov- I, as we've talked before on the show, we've come to a fork in the road. Uh, the governor is either going to need to uh, uh, gut up and say we're going to make big cuts, uh, and I've got 16 behind me in the legislature to do that, uh, and and sort of adopt that as his as his fiscal plan. There's still going to be deficits, but there'll be smaller deficits, uh, and there and the governor will still the governor will still need to finance those deficits. And I'm not clear how he's going to do that. The other fork in the road is the governor says, I don't have 21 plus 11 to make the changes we need. Uh, we're going to have sort of a, a, a continue on uh, budget. I'm going to make some cuts around the margin, but not the deep cuts we need. That That's going to have huge deficits, uh, huge revenue needs, and the governor's going to confront need to confront how he's going to finance uh, those, those revenue needs. It's going to be, um, the, the, the budget will be very telling. Uh, on how this legislature uh, is going to is going to come, what what direction the state's going to take, uh, and to me the big question is we're going to have deficits either way. The question is how the governor's going to finance those, or is he going to finance them equitably so that all Alaskans have to contribute uh, toward the cost of their government, or is he going to is he going to fall for the arguments that uh, that we ought to push this burden on middle and lower income Alaskans and let and let top 20 percent Alaskans off the hook. So the third of the big one, of course, I just touched on it before we, uh, before I jumped on with you here at the beginning of the hour, of course, is the unintended consequences of the COVID and the lockdowns and everything else. And that's the thing I think that many analysts are not really looking at is the overall, you know, the damage that's done to the economy. People, I mean, we just talked about the number of people who are behind on their rent. Uh, the average person, uh, you know, uh, you know, something like five thousand dollars behind in mortgages if they're unemployed, uh, and have been during the length of the pandemic. And the big question, of course, is: Is there more COVID help coming from the federal government? Uh, not that they have any real money, but I mean, they can make some up, I guess. What's your take on the COVID help coming from the feds, and what 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 happens to it here? You know, I I would think I, I think most analysts in D.C. tell you there is going to be a package. Uh, that uh, that that the 900 million dollar uh, 900 billion dollar excuse me I got to translate my millions to billions when I go to the federal level uh, the 900 billion dollar level uh, 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 package that uh, that uh, came out of uh, uh, several senators as a proposed compromise uh, this past week that's the likely vehicle uh, but there's a huge amount of disagreement. Uh, about about what's what ought to be in these packages, the size of the package, and I don't think it's guaranteed that there's going to be another COVID relief package. We're 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 approaching the date. The government is financed generally through December 11th, through this coming uh, through this coming Saturday. Uh, uh, we have a, we're under a continuing resolution which continued last year's uh, budget levels uh, for the federal government through through December 11th. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about combining uh, another COVID relief package with uh, uh, with uh, uh, the the final omnibus uh, uh, appropriations bill that would fund government uh, for for the current fiscal year. Uh, that the, both both bodies are now both the House and the Senate are passing uh, extensions of that continuing resolution. They've not been able to come to agreement uh, on the big uh, omnibus financing bill. 
that's giving them more time to work on the COVID relief bill. Um, and so there's some hope uh, that in this coming week they will come to ground on the, on the COVID relief bill. But there is a huge amount of, of, of pushback going on. For example, uh, uh, Senator Hawley uh, from, from Missouri uh, uh, this past, uh, in the past few days said that any COVID relief bill needs to include another check, another $1,200 check. Uh, to uh, to U.S. citizens, um, uh, that's not in the nine hundred billion dollar package. The the package would be much much higher in terms of dollar amount right. uh, if that were included in the package. So a lot a lot of controversy around it. I do think we will get one, but uh, it's it's far from certain that there will be another relief package. So so people counting on that, uh, uh, hedge your bets. Uh, uh, don't put all your money down on on assuming there's going to be another COVID relief package, uh, uh, hedge your bets because it's not certain that we're going to, that we're going to, that DC is going to, uh, put one together. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find him at ak4sb.com on the internet or, of course, on Facebook as well. I got links at the top of the page if you join us on Facebook this morning. Brad, thanks for coming on board and joining us. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.